acceptance is generally understood as a risk management strategy premised on gaining consents for conducting humanitarian action and implementing development work. Acceptance strategies aim to mitigate danger to aid workers by reducing the motivation of others to harm them. The logic is that if aid work is viewed positively, it will generate goodwill towards aid workers and allow them to do what they need to. There are varying degrees of acceptance and it falls along a spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum, you have a high level of acceptance whereby community members actively promote uh, the acceptance of an aid agency with other wider community members as well as uh, parties to the conflict. In the middle of that spectrum is a state whereby aid agencies are tolerated. They're tolerated enough to work safely, um, but community members don't, don't necessarily have that high degree of investment you see um, where they're highly accepted. And at the other end of the spectrum is outright rejection, which would include the targeting of aid workers and would be an environment where it's patently unsafe to work. In practice, gaining acceptance is more complex than simply doing good work and expecting it to guarantee your safety. Acceptance rests on three core factors. The first is the quantity and quality of the aid provided. The second is the degree to which potential threats or attackers value this aid. And the third is the social distance between those benefiting from aid and any potential threats. We see this most clearly with healthcare activities. Um, everyone in the community can benefit from medical services, including uh, armed groups, their families, uh, they benefit directly, of course. Um, and what you see actually in practice is that uh, armed groups are more likely to accept healthcare and medical uh, activities more so than, than some other kinds of activities. We see this with the Islamic State and its, its predisposition in, in Syria for um, healthcare charities to work over others. Humanitarian principles like neutrality, impartiality, and independence may also increase acceptance by convincing potential attackers that aid workers are not involved in the conflict and only interested in helping civilians. These principles can also be important to apply in non-conflict contexts, along with the principle of do no harm. A lot of what comprises an approach to gain, gaining and maintaining acceptance is at its core the basics of good practice in humanitarian and development work anyway. Uh, essentially, if you're providing something that the community wants, uh, if you're doing it in a participatory, conflict-sensitive, transparent and inclusive way, and if you're providing a high-quality outcome that shows tangible benefits to the community, you're generally fairly likely to be accepted enough to work safely, all other things, of course, being equal. Well, this is part of the problem with acceptance strategies. They're hard to define and monitor. It isn't simply that you can work safely without being attacked, um, because no one wants to wait until they've been attacked to know that they're not accepted. And this is what we would call a more laissez-faire approach to acceptance. Unfortunately, very few aid agencies take this active approach to acceptance. Um, it's inconsistently understood, it's poorly understood, and few agencies are working with a really systematic approach to acceptance. And it can be costly and time-consuming. It requires long-term investment in staff training, in outreach, in communication with communities. And these costs may be more difficult to justify to donors or others than, say, hard security expenditures like blast walls or armed guards. However, there is good practice to draw upon. Aid agencies can cultivate community buy-in through participatory needs assessments and the requirement that communities contribute directly to an activity. So this is what we would normally call community contribution, like providing labor or donating land to a specific activity. Any concrete demonstration that the community is actually invested in what you're doing is important. Beneficiary feedback mechanisms uh, can also enable agencies to gauge acceptance over time. They can also uh, detect any grievances or dissatisfaction and address those grievances or those dissatisfactions before they become real problems for the aid agency. Another key factor is your context assessments. 
um, understanding any underlying tensions or conflicts within the community, even in a non-conflict context, whether it's a you know localized conflict over resources or grazing rights or whatever it might be, um, you want to make sure as an aid agency that you're not aggravating that in your programming. Finally, establishing dialogue with conflict actors to gain their consent to work may reduce the risk that aid workers will be attacked. A great example of this is the case of polio vaccinations in Afghanistan. And beginning in 2007, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and other, other organizations uh, began negotiations with the Taliban leadership in Afghanistan. And from that year forward, with every vaccination campaign, Taliban leader Mullah Omar issues a directive to his fighters as well as a public statement urging fighters to allow vaccinators to work safely and also urging uh, families to get their kids vaccinated. In risk management theory, you have something called the security triangle or the security triad, and it's comprised of acceptance, protection, and deterrence. Uh, in contrast to acceptance, which, as we talked about before, focuses on reducing the threat, protection focuses on providing defense, defenses to potential threats or attackers. So it's, it's about making yourself uh, less vulnerable or less appealing to attack. Um, and this would include armored vehicles or you know, measures to heavily fortify your aid agency premises, like blast walls, like barbed wire, these kinds of things. Now, deterrence um, is what they call hardening the target and requires aid agencies to create a counter threat to potential attackers. Um, this could be armed guards. Also, at a higher level, it can be sort of sanctions economically or politically. Now, these three approaches are not mutually exclusive. You can combine aspects of acceptance with, for example, having armed guards or uh, using body armor in certain circumstances and that kind of thing. So protection, deterrence, and or acceptance can all be defined in varying configurations. However, it's important to remember that protection, deterrence, deterrent measures um, may impact the degree to which you're actually accepted. So many humanitarian agencies refuse to use armed guards for the fear that it will associate them to the conflict because they are with men usually <laughs> carrying guns, they, they fear they might be mistaken for you know, soldiers or fighters, and that will then reduce their acceptance. Um, by contrast, however, where humanitarian actors are not able to attain a sufficient degree of acceptance to work, they may agree to use armed convoys to travel to a specific location or armed guards under a certain set of circumstances.